أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيتي الطيبين الطاهرين الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي In the name of God the most beneficent the most merciful we ask Allah to send his greatest peace and blessings upon Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad we praise Allah for all these blessings we praise Allah for all the blessings he has given us and the greatest blessing being that he allowed us to be of the ones who remain steadfast dedicated and loyal on the path of our master after the prophet the commander of the faithful, the prince of the believers, the protector of the Prophet and his message, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. We praise Allah for this blessing and every blessing for without Allah, we would have nothing. Assalamu alaikum, my dear respected brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tonight, we're going to continue in the discussions that we've been having on the vision of a virtuous community. And the focus of tonight is the idea of the neighbors of God and the family of man. Now, what we're going to be covering here is understanding the significance of relationships when it comes to the building of a community. There are rights and obligations that we have to observe of one another ethically in order for, to, in order for us to effectively build a community in this idea of community development towards that virtuous community that was the vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the creation of Adam alayhi salam and all the way until the time and the occultation, the era of the occultation of Imam al-Mahdi, peace and blessings be upon him. This vision is going to be observed through observing all of these rights and obligations that we're going to be talking about um, in this, in this night, in this series, inshallah, in general and specifically here. Now, what I want us to, to cover uh, and, and pay up a close attention to in this lecture, in this presentation, is go going to be the following six questions. One, who are the neighbors of God? There's a reference to Jiranullah. Who are the neighbors of God? Two, what is the difference between brothers of trust and brothers of company? There's often a reference to brothers in our discourse, in our dialogue, in these relationships, who are our brothers? And what's the difference between brothers of trust and brothers of company? Three, what are the rights of your parents upon you as an adult? So we understand that sometimes as children, we may look at things as in the rights of parents upon us, but even as adults, what are the rights of our parents upon us? Fourth, what are the rights of children in Islam? Fifth, what is that sin that hastens death in accordance to Ahlul Bayt salam. And then sixth and finally, who did Lady Fatima pray for at night? We'll delve right in, we'll go into these questions. Inshallah, in answering these questions, we're gonna get a better idea of how relationships, the ones that are prescribed to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through the Holy Prophet and his family, how those can help build the foundation of that virtuous community. Now, the first question here is, who are the neighbors of God? There's a beautiful story that's mentioned in Wasa'il Shia by Sheikh Al-Hur Al-Amili. As, as you'll notice, some of these names, pay attention to some of these names of the scholars that were referencing the 17th, 17th century scholar who put this compilation of, uh, of narrations of a hadith together in Wasa'il Shia, Sheikh, Sheikh Al-Hur Al-Amili significant uh, scholar, one who many of the narrations, if you look to, you often hear him. You also hear Sheikh Al-Kulaini, for example, uh, in his book Al-Kafi, which is one of the most renowned books and heavily cited books when it comes to our narrations. Mind you, in understanding narrations, narrations are so important. Why? Because as Ahl al-Bayt told us, as the Prophet told us, the narrations go hand in hand with the Quran. Of course, any narration that conflicts with the Quran, as Imam Sadiq told us, any narration that conflicts with the Quran, any hadith that is at odds with the Quran is not from us. Do not take it. The Quran reigns supreme. The hadith, meaning the narrations, the traditions that are transmitted to us from Ahl al-Bayt, from the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, are there to supplement the Quran as many things are not necessarily found in the Qur'an as in what our obligations 
are. For example, when it comes to the prayer, you are obliged to pray. However, in the Quran, it doesn't necessarily say how many rak'at that you pray in every specific prayer. That is provided by the sunnah of the Prophet, the tradition of the Prophet, which we get from our ahadith. Just as a minor example, look at this beautiful story that's coming from Wasa'il Shia, where the Prophet tells his companions of a group of people that will become known as Jiranullah, the neighbors of God on the Day of Judgment. When they are resurrected on the Day of Judgment, they are going to be known and referred to as the neighbors of God. And Imam al-Baqir uh, narrates this tradition from the Holy Prophet. And the Prophet illustrates the scene for us. He says, إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ يُنَادِي مُنَادٍ مِنَ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ يُسْمَعُ, يسمع آخِرَهُمْ كَمَا يُسْمِعُ أَوَّلَهُمْ فَيَقُولْ أَيْنَ جِيرَانُ اللَّهِ أَيْنَ جِيرَانُ اللَّهِ جَلَّ جَلَالُهُ فِي دَارِهِ On that day, on the day of resurrection, a caller will call a command from God Almighty, one that will be heard for, to the furthest person as it is heard by the closest person. It's a grand call that's being made. He will call out, where are the neighbors of God exalted by his majesty in his abode? Now at that point, a group of people stand up. A group of people stand up and then a group of angels go to them seeing that they're standing up. And they say, what was the deed that you did? Because they've identified themselves. So the group of angels come. What was the deed that you did that made you become the neighbors of God? Because the angels at this point, they're kind of bewildered. All right, this is the group of people. God gave us the command. Who are the neighbors of God? These people stand up and they ask them, so what did you do to get this honor, this title of we are Jiranullah, we are the neighbors of God? They respond simply, They say, we used to love each other for the sake of God, and we supported each other for the sake of God Almighty. And then another call would come, from the angels. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would command this person to call out and say, my servants are truthful, leave them. Let them proceed towards God in heaven without any accounting for or judgment. Now, imagine how beautiful that is that you're given this title, this honor of being one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you that stamp of approval on the day of judgment on the day of resurrection, where everybody's, everybody's scared, everybody's afraid. The, the people are not knowing what's going to be the result of them on that day. Jiranullah, stand up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, all the angels, don't even question them. They are truthful. They have served me. They come towards me. No questioning. And Imam al-Baqir salam, when he's narrating this, it says that he follows up by saying, These are the neighbors of God in his abode. People will be afraid on that day, but they will not be afraid. And people will be judged on that day, but they will not be judged. Let's take a second to think about that. The whole significance that they held as the neighbors of God was that they loved each other. They loved each other and they supported each other in the same, in the sake of God, for the sake of God and in the name of God. You and I, brothers and sisters, can we love one another? Can we support one another? Can we, can we be happy for each other's success? Can we be there when we need each other the most? Can we ask about one another? Even when even when we're not close, when we're distant, can we not stay connected? They loved each other for the sake of God and they supported each other for the sake of God. And by that, they were able to attain that level of being the neighbors of God. The second question that we're going to in these relationships that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us through Ahlul Bayt alayhum is also cited in Wasa'il Shia. 
Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam narrates that there was a man from Basra who came visiting Imam Ali alayhi salam. And when he was visiting Imam Ali, the commander of the faithful, he's sitting down with him and he asks him, O oh, Imam, can you tell me about brothers? So he wants to know about brothers, about brotherhood, right? And specifically he's saying, Imam, tell me about brothers. Talk to me about brothers. And often you'll see in our narrations where some of the companions of Ahlul Bayt or some of the visitors of Ahlul Bayt, their students or what have you, they would ask the Imams, tell me about this. Tell me what my responsibility is generally. What should I do to gain closeness to God? What should I do uh, to uh, get more rizq, to get more sustenance? And you'll see beautiful advice that's given by Ahl al-Bayt Question may be very simple like this, just a few words, tell me about brothers, but then you get an answer like this. Al-Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he looks at this man, this Basrawi, this person who is coming to him from Basra, visiting the Imam in Kufa, and he tells him, Al-Ikhwan Sunfan, Ikhwan al he says, brothers are of two types. Brothers of trust and brothers of company. Brothers of trust, the Imam says, are like your hand, your limbs, your family, and your wealth. If you trust your brother, make sure that you give him from your wealth. Make sure that you give him from your support. Be a friend to all of his friends and be an enemy to all of his enemies. Keep his secrets, safeguard them. Help him and show whatever is good of him. Help him and show whatever is good of him. And know, O oh one who asks me, that they are more rare or rarer than red sulfur. Brothers of trust, that's a big one. Brothers of trust are people that are as rare as red sulfur and as attributed to the Imam alayhi salam is lucky is one who has a true friend, one true friend in his entire lifetime. Hold on to them. So take a moment to reflect on this. We're going to go into the brothers of company. What's the difference between brothers of trust and brothers of company? Brothers of trust we established. These are very rare people. These are people that you want to protect them. They want to protect you. You want to safeguard them. They want to safeguard you. You want to take care of them. They're going to take care of you. Your secrets, your wealth, your family, your health, all are entrusted to this individual without a blink of the eye, without a second doubt. Now, what about brothers of company? Because these individuals, I mean, they're very rare. You might not even have one. You may have one. Hold on to them. As rare as red sulfur. The brothers of company are like this. As for the brothers of company, the Imam says, they are the ones through which you attain your enjoyment of socialization. These are the individuals who you socialize with. Do not disconnect from them and do not seek to understand their intention behind this. Show them the same as that they show you of cordial demeanor and pleasant conversation. Now, this is a true lesson of socialization and social engagement for us as followers of Ahlul Bayt, as Muslims. How do you look at friends? How do you look at people? Now, again, brothers of trust, people that keep your secrets, people that take care of you, protect you, look out for you and your family, are ones that you can trust with your family, your health, your wealth, etc., etc., very rare. Make sure you safeguard yourself and your family and everything and not necessarily trust just anybody in that regard. Those are people that are very, very close, very close circle. Now, there's a lot of other people that may not necessarily fit that category. The Imam is telling you, these are still your brothers. These are still brothers of company. Brothers of company are ones, don't be distant from them. Don't disconnect from them. Don't disconnect from these individuals. These are people that you have in attending events and spending time with, of course, not necessarily too much depth in that time, but in socialization, they're there. In, in this engagement, they're definitely there. Don't necessarily go and try to find out their intention and everything that they're doing. Don't necessarily try to figure out everything about them. Make sure that you reciprocate that beautiful demeanor and make sure that if they're good with you, that you're good with them and continue to have pleasant conversation and be pleasant with them. That is a pure lesson for us in how do we look at our brothers, our sisters, and that engagement of what it means to be brothers in trust and brothers in company. Speaking about brothers, 
what are the rights of our brothers? And again, as brothers, we're also saying sisters. So what are the rights of our brothers, our sisters? And Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam, in his beautiful work, Risalat al-Hukuq, the treaties on rights, he explains to us dozens of rights of people upon us and things upon us. And some of those include our family members, some of those include our colleagues, our neighbors, our scholars, our teachers, uh, our workers, people from all different sorts and all different backgrounds. A beautiful, beautiful work that will truly give you a better comprehensive understanding of the way the world works through the lens of the Imams. This is one of the earliest cited works on human rights dating back over 1,200 years. And this was made by who? By Imam Zain al-Abidin, the son of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, the one who survived Karbala and was the fourth Imam of Ahlul Bayt. When you look at the treaties of rights, you see him cite to the right of your brother. The right of your bro brother, as the Imam says, and connect this with brothers of trust and brothers of company, and connect this to one, your, the rights of your brothers as your blood brothers, and then also the rights of your brothers in Islam and your sisters in Islam. As for the right of your brother, it is that you know that he is your hand with which you give, your support on which you lean, your honor in which you rely, and your might with which you strike. So do not take him as a weapon with which you disobey God. And or a means with which to wrong God and his creatures. Look at that. Look at that beauty of the Imam's words here. Know that your brother is your hand by which you give. You do so much through your, your brother. He's your back. He's your support. He's the one you lean on. He's your honor that you rely on. He's the might with which you strike. But don't make him a weapon because of all of that. Do not make him a weapon that you use in disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or hurting or harming people through your brother. Furthermore, Do not neglect to support him against himself or aid him against his enemy. Look at this. Do not neglect to support him against himself aid him against his enemy, separate between him and his demeanor. And this specifically, it means his ill thoughts or give him good counsel and grow close to him for the sake of God. If he returns to God and succeeds in obeying him, that is well and good. However, let God be as a higher priority and greater honor over you than him. Take this with you. You and I, a lot of times when it comes to our relationships, especially when it comes to our brothers and sisters, be it in our biological relationships, our blood brothers and sisters, or our brothers and sisters in Islam, the Imam is telling you, you have such a special relationship with this individual. You have such a special relationship with your brother. He's your might. He is the one that you can do. He is do through. He is the one that you rely on. He is your back, your support but don't misuse him. And make sure that you are there to support him even against himself. Meaning what? If he's doing something wrong, be there to be his mirror. Be there to show him what the wrong that's being done and support him. And be there, of course, if he has enemies, if he has people that are going to harm him, be there to be that support system for him. But make sure that you separate between him and his ill thoughts. Sometimes we go through rough patches. Sometimes we go through misguidance. Sometimes we are misguided in the sense of we're doing things the right way, the wrong way. And in those times, of course, your judgment of him is different than what he is thinking, what he is doing. But make sure in all of this, in being good counsel to him and growing closer to him, that the priority here is always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your brotherhood with him, regardless if he is blood or not, your brotherhood with him is what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the name of God. Also connecting back to what? Jiranullah that we mentioned in the very beginning. Jiranullah 
The reason why they became the neighbors of God is that they loved and supported one another. Look at here, Imam Zain al-Abidin, the emphasis that he has on support of your brother. They loved and supported one another for the sake of God, in the name of God, in the love of God. Those are our brothers. Now, the third question that we ask in these relationships are, what are the rights of our parents? What are the rights of our parents even as adults? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran in chapter 4, verse 36, He says, Worship God and do not ascribe any partners to Him. First premise in this verse, Worship God, do not ascribe any partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives as a directive in this verse in the Quran, He says, And be good to your parents. Be good to parents, relatives, orphans, the needy, the near neighbor and the distant neighbor, the companion at your side, the traveler and your servants. Indeed, God does not like those who are arrogant and boastful. Parents are second only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the directives that he's giving in this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, worship Allah. Worship God. Worship me. Don't ascribe any partners to me. After obeying me, I want you to take care of the following people. Be good to the following people. The first on that list of goodness to people is our parents. Now, we got to be good to our parents. What do we do? How do we, before we understand what we should do, as in being good, don't we need to realize what our rights and obligations are in that relationship? What are the rights of our parents? And for the young parents that are listening, what are your rights upon your children? And then remember, when you're trying to make sure that, yes, I have these rights upon my children, and I would want them to grow up realizing and appreciating and respecting these rights, there's also that reminder that if I want my children to be with me in a certain way, I need to make sure that I manifested that in my relationship with my parents. And again, Risalatul Hukuq, Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, explains to us and gives us this breakdown of what are the rights of our parents. He starts off, or will start off, with the right of our mother. Now, the right of our mother and the right of our father, if you want to go again and look this up in Risalatul Hukuq, you can go online, Treaties on Rights, Imam al-Sajjad, type that in Google, it'll be one of the first results that you get. And you'll see in number 22 and number 23, explains to us the rights of the mother and the rights of the father. Quickly, let's get a breakdown of what the rights of the mother are. The Imam says, As for the right of your mother, it is to know that she carried you where no one carries anyone. She fed you from the fruit of her heart. That which no one else can give to anyone. And she protected you with her hearing, her sight, and all of her organs. She was fine if she went hungry as long as you were fed. If she went thirsty as long as you drank. If, you were, if she was naked, unclothed, if you were, as so long as you were clothed. And that even if she remained in the scorching sun so long as that you were in the shade, she ensured your happiness. She wanted you to be happy and ensured your happiness, though she remained woeful. As long as you were happy, she was fine. And ensured that you enjoyed sleep, even if she was deprived of it and remained wakeful. You wish to thank her for all of this. But you can't. Save what? You wish to remain thankful. As the Imam says, you wish to remain thankful to her. You wish to be thankful for this, but you will not be able to give her justice or do her justice without the help of God. Mind you, if you look closely into it, and, and this is abbreviated, but I remember when I was first reading it, there's one part in the Treaties of Rights, in this specific one, number 22, the Imam says that she did all of this so that you might belong to her. All of this so you might belong to her. Because there's a possibility that you don't. And none of this can be repaid back to her. None of this. The Imam 
continues and tells us of the rights of our father. But you know what? Before the going into the rights of our father, we're going to cover uh, another beautiful narration that is one of the companions asks the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. He asks Rasulullah, he says, I want to devote my time and my attention to something so that I can gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Rasulullah, what do you advise me to do? Who do you advise me to spend my time with? Or what action do you advise me to do? The Prophet responds with a very simple response. He says, your mother. It's like, okay, I get it. I have to spend time with my mom. I have to uh, pay attention to her and, and, and take care of her. What else, Ya Rasulullah? What else or who else should I give my time and attention? He says a second time, your mother. Then he asks a third time and he says, your mother. Then this companion, he's persisting. He's like, okay, I get it. This is, this is a big emphasis here, but fourth time, he says, who else? What else should I do? He says, and your father. Now with our fathers, we have to realize what rights they have upon us. And Imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam, he says, وَأَمَّ حَقُّ أَبِيكَ فَتَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ أَصْلَكَ As for the right of your father, it is to know that he is your root, that you are his branch, and that without him you would not be. Whenever you see anything in yourself that pleases you, know that your father is the root of its blessing upon him, upon you. Know that your father is the root of that blessing upon you. So praise God and thank him in that measure. Anything that we find to be great in ourselves, know that it's really coming from your parents. Your mother who protected you with all of her organs and took care of you like no one else could. And your father being that root of God's blessing upon you. He is your root. Regardless of our relationship with our parents and the uh, bumps that, have, that we've experienced down the road. And this is a reality. We have to acknowledge that our relationship with them, regardless of what they have done, we have a reaction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is expecting from us. And that is, regardless of what has happened between you and your parents, that you still have these obligations towards them. That I still want you after me, after worshiping me and making sure nothing is in conflict with me, that you take care of your parents and you do, do good towards them because they are your root. And they are the ones that from which you would not even exist if it was not for them. Now, the fourth question that we asked was, what are the rights of our children? So let's say we have kids, we don't have kids, whatever situation may be, this is important for you to realize why, because this is a basic foundation of children's rights in Islam. And again, like we said, this document, the Treatise on Rights, was one of the earliest documented books or uh, uh, documents on human rights. So children rights here, the Imam says, Listen to this. As for the right of your child, it is that you should know that he is from you and will be ascribed to you through both his good and his evil in the immediate affairs of this world. You are responsible for what you teach him of good conduct, pointing him in the direction of his Lord and helping him to obey him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in all of his commandments. You will be rewarded for that if you teach him well and punished if you teach him ill. Our kids are our responsibility. They're our product. They're an extension of us. We're responsible to push them in the right direction or not. In the end, of course, as someone becomes of age, they have responsibility towards themselves and towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It becomes their uh, maturity. When they reach that age of maturity, now they're responsible. Now they're adults. However, us as parents, be it young parents, older parents, whatever it may be, us as parents, we're responsible to our kids to point them in the right direction. We're responsible to be those role models for them. And if we do good towards them, then we're going to be rewarded for it. And if we do ill towards them, as in we don't show them the way, and we misguide them, that's on us. That's on us. That's our responsibility. Our children look to us. And I know, I'll tell you, with my daughter, when I see my daughter, she's a sponge. Anything that she hears, anything that she hears or sees, she's imitating, she's mimicking. She's two and a half, right? Very sensitive age. But trust me, as early as two and even before two, your children are doing things 
right after you. They're doing things looking at you, watching you. I observe how attentive she is to the things I say, to the things my wife says, to the things that are done in the house. And that will continue as your daughters, as your sons grow up, and we're responsible for that. Furthermore, we asked ourselves beyond these relationships that we've just mentioned, we asked in the very beginning a question, the fifth question being, what is the sin that hastens death? Is there a sin that hastens death? Now, there's a really wonderful story that is mentioned uh, by Sheikh Al-Kulaini in Al-Kafi. And this is a narration from Abu Hamza Thumali. If you mem remember in some of the nights previously, we, were, we mentioned this companion of Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam. Abu Hamza was considered to be one of the best companions of Ahl al-Bayt. He was a companion of Imam Sajjad Zain al-Abidin, of Imam al-Baqir, and of Imam al-Sadiq. He was referred to as the Salman of his time, or he was, would become known as the Salman of his time as in Salman, Salman al-Farisi, who was one of the closest and best companions of the Prophet. Now, he would become known by, by many through the supplication, one of the greatest supplications of Imam Zayn al-Abidin taught to him, and that, that, name, Zayn, uh, that name of Abu Hamza al-Thumali would become the title of that dua in honor of this companion who had dedicated his life to Ahl al-Bayt So he narrates, this story from the commander of the faithful, Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib So Imam Ali is in Kufa and he's giving one of his sermons and there is a group of people uh, listening to the Imam. The Imam is giving the sermon and he says, in part of the sermon, he says, أعوذ بالله من الذنوب التي تعجل الفناء I seek refuge from the sins that hasten death. The commander of the faithful is telling I seek closeness, I seek refuge from God, with God, from the sins that hasten death. One of the khawarij that's sitting in the crowd, the narration says one of the khawarij stands up and he says, asking the imam, are there sins that hasten death? In a way challenging the imam and what he was saying. He says, are there sins that hasten death? The imam responds, Naam, waylak, qati'atul rahm. He says, woe unto you. Yes, of course, it is neglecting the family ties or family relations, which hastens death. The Imam continues and he says, a household that gathers and comforts one another, even while they sin publicly, God will still bless them despite their transgressions. However, a household that is divided, where each neglects their familial rights, and their responsibilities towards one another, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deprive them from his mercy, even if they are pious. Reflect on that. Regardless of our, our deeds, regardless of if we are pious or if we are sinful, this specific point with regards to maintaining family ties is so essential in keeping grace and mercy in our households that the Imam emphasizes, even if you are a family or a household that sins publicly, but you are good to one another and you take care of one another in your responsibilities as a family, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still bless that household. But that family that doesn't and supposedly assumes to be religious or pious, they've lost their piety and religiosity when they have neglected their family ties and that brings the hastening of death. We come to our last and final question of this part of the series, which is, what did Lady Fatima alayhi salam, Fatima bint Muhammad, Sayyidatu Nisa al-Alameen, the most amazing figure after her mother, who emulated every action of her mother, Lady Khadija, who we spoke of uh, in the previous nights and we remembered her, uh, her wafat. Lady Fatima alayhi salam being second to none and she was the greatest woman to ever walk this earth, honored in so many ways by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a brief story to see the beauty of Lady Fatima alayhi salam in her character and her conduct. So one night, as is mentioned by Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam in this narration, uh, which is cited in At-Tabari's uh, work, Dala'il al-Imama, in this particular uh, story, 
الإمام الحسن عليه السلام it's one night one night الإمام الحسن عليه السلام the son of Lady Fatima he stayed awake and he wanted to watch his mother Fatima as she always did pray at night so he went to the side and he would watch his mother as the nightfall came ascend in her prayer and he would watch her throughout the night she would pray and pray and pray and continue praying all throughout the night until dawn lady fatima alayhi salam was praying until fajr imam al hasan this young boy is just looking at his mother listening to the prayers that she's making finally when she was done finally when she broke he went to his mom and he asked her oh mother i've heard you pray throughout the night I've heard you pray for everyone, the poor, the sick, the needy, your neighbors, the community, everybody in need, everybody in everybody that you can think of. The Imam is telling her, I've heard you pray for everyone, but I didn't hear you pray for yourself. Everyone had a prayer with Lady Fatima, except Fatima. Lady Fatima السلام, gazed upon her young boy, smiled and said, Ya Bunay, al -jar my son, put your neighbor before yourself, before your household. Lady Fatima alayhi salam tells us, basically, be selfless in your prayer. If you want to ascend to this, the, this level and this greatness when it comes to being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and committing yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you want to be like Ahlul Bayt and the companions of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, think about other people. Love other people, love each other, support one another, think of one another, pray for one another. Let us be on each other's minds. How is she doing? I hope they're doing well right now. Inshallah, they're okay. Inshallah, they're safe. Check on people, even if you don't know them. Check on them. Send people messages. Try to connect with people and make sure that people realize that I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. I want you to be taken care of. If you need anything, I will take care of it. Let me help if I can. And if you can't help, let's say directly, there is nothing greater than a sincere prayer. And Lady Fatima alayhi salam showed us that. Lady Fatima alayhi salam gave us that. Let us be in the way of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam and all of this brothers and sisters and realize what we can do in these nights and seeking closeness and developing this virtuous community as a quick breakdown. We want to go over those last six questions and make sure that we've answered all of them. We'll start from the very beginning with the question, the neighbors of God. Who are the neighbors of God? They're the ones who loved each other for the sake of God. Secondly, the brothers of trust and the brothers of company. The brothers of trust are the ones that you basically trust everything with, your wealth, your health, your family. The brothers of company are the ones that you enjoy time with and socializing. Thirdly, the rights of our parents are that we realize what they have given us, that they are our roots, that without them, we simply could not be, and that we have a responsibility to think of them, to care for them, and be there for them. Fourthly, the right of our children is that we are to protect them and show them the way to God and bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fifthly, that sin that brings and hastens death is cutting our family ties. And sixthly, sixth, all night, Lady Fatima alayhi salam, who did she pray for? She prayed for everyone but herself. And know that brothers and sisters, when you pray for other people, and you may not remember yourself in your prayer, you're not being neglected. The angels of the heavens are praying for you as you pray for others. Let us continue to pray with one another and continue to build towards this vision of a virtuous community. هذا والحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة والتسليم على نبينا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين.